Welcome. Thanks for being here for Mount St. Helens, A Landscape Across Time, a program jointly organized by the Portland Art Museum and our friends at the Mount St. Helens Institute. I'm Stephanie Parrish, Director of Learning and Community Partnerships at the Portland Art Museum, and I'm coming at you live from the museum's grand Schnitzer Family uh, Sculpture Court in downtown Portland, Oregon, a space I haven't physically been in since March 13th, when we closed our doors due to the pandemic. While all of our guests today will be beaming in from their own homes, we thought getting a glimpse of the museum space and the incredible exhibition that we're gonna be talking about today might be a nice change of scenery. While many of you may be joining from elsewhere, around the country or even the globe, I wanna begin our time together by recognizing and honoring the indigenous peoples of this region on whose ancestral lands the Portland Art Museum now stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Claflamet, Malala, Multnoma, and Wotlala Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin Kayapua, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and many other Native communities who have made their homes along the Columbia River. We also want to recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all Indigenous communities, past, present, and future, and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. We also want to acknowledge the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakama Nation, and their ancestors, for whom Mount St. Helens has been a sacred place for generations. Today is May 17th. This is the day that we were actually scheduled to close the exhibition, Volcano Mount St. Helens in Art. If the pandemic had not hit, this space that I'm sitting in would be buzzing with thousands of people, all hoping to catch a last glimpse of the exhibition. But alas, we are happy to share that we are not closing the show. In fact, the great news to share with you is that the, when the museum reopens, and we don't have a date yet, but when we do, this show will be up and it will stay up until the end of 2020. We hope to see all of you here again. We miss you and we are really looking forward to opening back up again. Our program today on the eve of the 40th Eruptiversary is to spend some time reflecting on the incredible art and objects in this show. But to do so by layering on the perspectives of folks who live and breathe Mount St. Helens every day. We're happy to be joined by Barbara Noah, Seattle-based artist, Sonia Melander, science education manager at the Mount St. Helens Institute, Nathan Reynolds, ecologist and interim director of cultural resources at the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, and Ray Yurkovitz, director of the Mount St. Helens Institute. We acknowledge that Mount St. Helens is a vast physical and psychic landscape with countless stories and personal experiences, a place across time of unparalleled natural beauty and joy, of destruction and renewal, a sacred place, and a place where 57 people lost their lives on May 18, 1980. We'll touch on some of these themes today and know that many of you out there will have your own perspectives to share. We hope that some of you will ask questions at the end or even leave your own stories and reflections in the Facebook comments. Before I turn it over to Dawson and our special guests, I have a few housekeeping items to share. As you know, we're beaming live via Zoom and Facebook. There'll be time for Q&A at the end, so please type those into the Q&A section or the Facebook comments. And my amazing colleague, John Richardson, is gonna help monitor those and get them to me. John is also running live captioning. At any time, you can access captions by opening a separate window on your computer or your mobile device and visit pam.to forward slash captions. That's P-A-M dot T-O forward slash C-A-P-T-I-O-N-S. Thank you, John. And we'll put this information in the Zoom chat box and the Facebook comments. Okay, now let me introduce you to Dawson Carr. Dawson is the Janet and Richard Geary Curator of European Art, and maybe just as important, is a self-described volcano nerd since he was a little boy. Dawson is hands down one of my favorite people here at the museum. His smarts, his warmth, and his hearty laugh are legendary on staff. And it was probably over a year ago that he pulled me aside to say that he was going to take the leap and do an exhibition on Mount St. Helens. And this was a big deal 
because as a scholar of Italian and Spanish Renaissance and Baroque art, he was nervous to work outside of his area of expertise and to work with living artists. Most of the folks he studies have been dead for at least 200 years, and they don't call him up and they don't send him emails. But as you will hear and learn yourselves, uh, Mount St. Helens was in very capable and generous hands. Dawson was also the first to insist that his perspective as curator be just one of many. He wanted lots of voices represented in this exhibition. And so there've always been a lot of proverbial, proverbial hands in this exhibition pot, including artists, the Cowlitz Indian tribe, and our partnership with the Mount St. Helens Institute. So a big thank you, Dawson, for bringing this show to life and for creating community around the exhibition. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dawson and you will see me again at the end for Q&A. Thanks, Dawson. Thank you, Stephanie, very much for those kind words. And back at you, um, Stephanie has developed some of the wonderful programs that accompany the exhibition. And I'm sure she'll be developing more for the exhibition as we prolong it. It's such a pleasure to be here today. And I'm thrilled to share the exhibition on the eve of the eruptiversary and to do so with some of the incredible people I've had the great good fortune of meeting in the course of working on the exhibition. Our plan is to sh share highlights from the show and to use the works of art as a way to surface stories about the art, cultures, and science of this incredible landscape. This will be conversational and somewhat informal, and we hope informative too. Um, before we jump in, I'd like you to meet uh, some of the people who will join me and to have them introduce themselves and give you a taste of their connection to Mount St. Helens. Let's start with the artist, Barbara Noah. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Barbara Noah, an artist from Seattle, and I'm in the Volcano Show at the Portland Art Museum. And my connection to Mount St. Helens is that I visited it many times, including on May 18th, 1980. And of course I made work about it. Thank you. Um, now, Nathan Reynolds. Hello Dawson, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I have a long history with Mount St. Helens, including um, getting my scouting canoeing merit badge in Spirit Lake and also becoming immediately a volcano nerd when the mountain erupted in 1980. I currently work for the Cowlitz Indian Tribe as their interim director of the Cultural Resources Department uh, and am an ethnoecologist. So I study habitats with humans involved. Thank you. Uh, now our colleagues from the Mount St. Helens Institute. Uh, first up, uh, Sonia Melander. Hi, and thanks, Dawson, and thank you for putting together such an incredible exhibit. So my name is Sonia Melander, and I'm the Science Education Manager with the Mount St. Helens Institute. And like many of the panelists here, I'm a volcano nerd. I got my master's degree studying volcanology, the science of volcanoes, so I'm going to be sharing some of my thoughts and ponderings of the art through that lens of volcanology with you today. Thank you. And finally, uh, Ray Yerkowitz, uh, the director of the Mount St. Helens Institute. Hi, Dawson. Hello, all. Thank you so much uh, for having us here tonight, uh, this afternoon, and having us as part of this exhibition, as part of this partnership with the Portland Art Museum. We're so thankful and grateful uh, and I personally uh, am just so happy about the friendships that have developed uh, throughout this. And it's been challenging for the past two months, of course, but um, I'm really happy to be able to hear, be here today and, and commemorate uh, uh, the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. So again, Ray, uh, director with the Institute. And the Institute is all about connecting people uh, with science, the outdoors, public lands, critical thinking, through Mount St. Helens, we've got this incredibly dynamic and inspiring landscape to work with to kind of get folks engaged in these really important things, things that are more important now than perhaps they've ever been. Um, so that's what we do at the Institute. Personally, I've been working at Mount St. Helens since 2007 
It is a huge passion of mine. I too am a volcano nerd. Um, and you know, after 13 years of, of spending a lot of my time thinking about Mount St. Helens, there's still so much to discover. There are so many layers to this, uh, to this, this landscape and so many stories it has to tell. And this exhibition really has been a, a big aha for me to see it through such a broad lens from so many different perspectives. So i um, excited to, uh, to, to show everybody this exhibition tonight. Thank you all very much for being with us. Uh, here you see the entry hall in which Stephanie is uh, now sitting uh, quiet uh, today. Um, and I, I should tell you that the exhibition actually began as a general overview of volcano imagery and world art. And finally, when it dawned on me that we were fast approaching the 40th anniversary of the uh, great eruption of 1980, um, I went to my director, Brian Ferrizo, and he completely agreed that we shift and we concentrate on Mount St. Helens. As a part of the display in the Schnitzer Court that you just saw, um, there's this area, isolated and by itself. And I'd like to bring Nathan in at this point to talk about Mount St. Helens as a sacred place to Native Americans. Thanks, Dawson. The Mount St. Helens, or as known uh, to the Cowlitz people as Lawat Latla, is, um, is more than just a mountain. She has a larger role in the community. Her name translates as person from whom smoke comes. And part of the heritage not just in physical art pieces uh, like you see here, but uh, in the deeper culture of songs and stories and human history and theater is that she has her own personality. She has her own opinions and she is not just someone from whom smoke comes, but she is the keeper of the fire. And so she's her role in many of the narratives about how this landscape came to be involve her keeping fire, uh, involve her sharing that at times, not sharing it at other times, and also um, transitioning sometimes from being an old woman to a young maiden. And in one sense, these are very important narratives about the landscape and geology but simultaneously these are important narratives about how people should treat each other, how you should respect one another, not only in your interpersonal relationships, but in your group relationships as well. So this, this role of the mountain in uh, cultural history is thousands of years deep in this landscape and goes well beyond just the 1980 eruption. Thanks very much. Um, I should say that Native Americans felt no need to, to portray uh, Mount St. Helens as a, a living presence in the landscape, but they did use the stuff of volcanoes, volcanic material, uh, to make both utilitarian objects and artworks like you see in the case here. These are objects from the collection of the Portland Art Museum. And I have to tell you that when I started this work, I didn't fully realize how extraordinary they are. They are all made from basalt, uh, the most common volcanic stone. And we can't know um, if any of these were actually made from basalt laid down by Mount St. Helens, but they still apply. They're certainly from the volcanoes uh, along the Columbia River. This is the earliest known depiction of Mount St. Helens. Um, it was made by Henry James Ware, who was a British spy spent, sent over with a party to determine whether the British could win a war against the United States for the Oregon Territory. It was all settled even before they got back to London uh, with the Oregon Treaty of 1846. Um, but Ware's visit to the area happened to coincide with a, a fairly long eruptive period at the mountain. And as you can see here, 
he witnessed uh, an eruption of steam and ash emanating from a vent on the north side of the volcano. We're right at Longview, Washington here, present day Longview, Washington. And um, well, you can see there's Mount Rainier off to the far left and we see a Mount Adams peaking up at right. Two years later, the Canadian ethnographer, uh, artist and explorer Paul Kane traveled through the area. Um, Kane was a salvage uh, ethnographer, um, uh, someone who thought that he was recording dying cultures. We know that that's hardly the case. Um, and his principal purpose was that. He made this watercolor the day after he set off from Fort Vancouver in a canoe. And as you can see, the volcano is quiet. Soon thereafter, uh, it did erupt, uh, most likely from the same vent uh, that we saw in the where just now. And we're right at this point near what would, was known as the Cowlitz Farm near modern day uh, Toledo, uh, uh, Washington. And there you can see that eruption of steam and ash. He got back to Toronto and took these two sketches and combined them to make the oil painting at lower left. Um, you can see he used the trees and water from the first drawing, and then put in the erupting volcano, shifting it slightly to make uh, that vent more visible. Of course, the really significant difference between uh, this painting and the drawings is that it's cast as a nocturnal scene and we see a fiery eruption. Um, and this is the point at which we have to stress that works of art are not necessarily works of documentation um, because this is a fantasy. And it was based on Kane's knowledge of European art. He'd been in the early 1840s, he visited Europe, he spent a long time in Italy where he would have known paintings like this, this one from our collection at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, showing Vesuvius erupting about 1790. It was at that point in the middle of a 300 year uh, eruptive cycle. And as you can see, uh, part of the point was make it a nocturnal scene to show off the vivid pyrotechnics, um, have it reflected in the water. And Kane, uh, of course, as Native Americans in a canoe observing, uh, whereas in a lot of these pictures, there are Turks uh, visiting Naples uh, in the foreground. I wanna pause briefly here and, and make a little aside because this painting is a beautiful example of, uh, shows a beautiful example of volcanic bombs, those clots of molten lava that are ejected from the volcano and uh, coalesce in flight. And I'm gonna segue here to this bread crust bomb that the Mount St. Helens Institute kindly uh, lent us to show in as a part of the exhibition. And Sonia, would you tell us about it? Yeah, of course, thank you, Dawson. So this rock is called a bread crust bomb. And actually it's my favorite type of rock. And that's for two reasons. So one, it's unique to volcanoes and it has a really interesting origin story that I'll talk about in a minute. And this one is of course from Mount St. Helens specifically. And second, it reminds me of one of my favorite foods, which is a delicious crusty bread, right? That's how it gets its name. So when I think about really delicious bread, you know, I think about bread that has this golden to dark brown crust, with cracks all over the outside. And then inside the bread is light and airy with holes of different sizes. And so to get that, you bake the bread and it rises in the oven, it expands. And as that's happening, a crust starts to develop on the outside. And as the bread continues to rise, continues to expand, it breaks and cracks the rock on the outside. 
And so bread crust brahms are actually really similar to that. It's not just like it looks like bread, it kind of forms in a similar way. So when volcanoes erupt, they can sometimes throw out these partially molten blobs of lava into the air. And so they're soaring through the air in a curve. And as they're doing that, they're number one, beginning to cool on the outside. So as it cools, it's forming this brittle surface and hardening. But inside this partially molten lava that's soaring through the air, there's gas, gas that had been dissolved in the magma in the lava. But now that it's soaring through the sky, there's this opportunity for the gas to expand. So like the bread rising in the oven, it's the bomb is expanding from the inside of itself. So it has these bubbles on the outside, and then as it's expanding like the bread, it's cracking that hardened surface on the outside. And that is why I think lava bombs are neat. They're very yeah. neat. And Sonia, how large can they be? Uh, very large. Uh, so in, I don't know if, let me back up. Bread crust bombs are one type of volcanic bomb. They, you get different names for them um, based off of, of course, their size, but also the shape. So sometimes when, when it's more liquidy, it can splat on the ground, and then those are called cow pie bombs. <laughs> so there's different kinds. But in the 1980 eruption, there were a series of photographs taken. And from those photographs, um, people used some smarts and know-how and math to estimate some of the sizes of things soaring through the sky. And some of those were estimated to be the size of small trailers. So whether that ended up being a bread crust bomb, I don't know. But definitely lobs of lava that big as small trailer size were soaring through the air. Yes, because we see in the Fidanza, some of those are really large. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'll take us back uh, to the exhibition now um, and proceed ahead. Um, those who were fortunate enough to see the exhibition um, did not see this work. Uh, we only became aware of it a few days before the exhibition opened. Uh, it was bought by local collectors. And even though they just hung it on their walls, we begged them to, to, to loan it to us. Uh, and I was planning to do a bit of, re of rearranging of that uh, first room um, because it so beautifully sets the stage and highlights the relationship of the human settlements um, uh, uh, near the mountain with the mountain. And here we're looking down from somewhere in the as yet undeveloped west hills of Portland onto the burgeoning city below. That's the Willamette run running through the middle. And up in the uh, middle left, all the way over to the left side, you see a sliver of the Columbia River and that's Vancouver, Washington developing on its banks. Ray, um, is this a, a fairly accurate portrayal of the mountains? Well, that's what I found interesting about this piece was just kind of the degree of detail and, uh, and accuracy. Some things I note here, uh, this is from 1887. And so as you're looking across, you can see Mount Rainier uh, peeking out uh, to the left of Mount St. Helens. You can see uh, Mount Adams to the right. And in front of all those mountains, you see what's a common sight now is Silver Star Mountain which is uh, you know, now open because there was a large fire in the early 1900s at Yakko Burton. So this was before that. And so it's just interesting to see something so realistic uh, of, a, of a period of time that um, you know, I'd be curious to have gone back there and see what it was like. So I, 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 that's why I enjoyed this piece. Well, and I, and I think for all Portlanders, um, please note uh, the absence of bridges uh, across the Willamette. Um, we were scheduled to install the painting the Monday following our closure. And by the time we reopen, we'll have it on the walls for people to enjoy. And we're very grateful to the collectors um, because they literally had just received it, received it, hung it on their walls, and they've very generously made it available to everyone. There are quite a few works of art ranging from the uh, 1860s up until 
1980. And before I go into just a couple of them, I want to uh, thank very much Mark Humple of Mark Humple Fine Arts in Selwood, who really helped me find these paintings. Uh, there's a few from public collections that I knew about, but most of them come from private collections, and we're very grateful to all the owners uh, for making it possible for people to see them. I want to show you this one by Grace Russell Fountain. In her time, she was uh, one of the most distinguished painters working in Portland. Um, and this is her only known depiction of Mount St. Helens. And it truly illustrates the beautiful symmetry of the mountain um, uh, before the eruption. And Grace Fountain had a marvelous ability to create these luminous scenes by uh, uh, conveying minute variations in light and shade. And it's one of the most lovely depictions of the mountain. Then I'll show you one more from this part. Um, and this is by Clara Jane Stevens, who was a distinguished American Impressionist, known far beyond Portland. But she was also uh, someone very dear at the Portland Art Museum because she taught in the museum school from 1917 until her retirement in 1938. And she really knew how to move paint around. Uh, here you see this thickly applied paint with subtle gradations in color. And one of the things that I most appreciate about this depiction of the mountain is the inclusion of that telephone pole, the uh, highlighting the blight of human infrastructure on the once pristine landscape. Ryan Molenkamp is uh, another major volcano nut. Um, he's fascinated with volcanoes. I'll refer you to his website uh, to look at uh, a long, long series of works on volcanoes that he calls Fear of Volcanoes. And these three works forming a series are the only ones that I know of who took off from some of the time-lapse photography uh, that was made of the eruption uh, on May the 18th, 1980. Um, in this case, not the more famous uh, photographs of Gary Rosenquist, but those of Vern Hodgson, a contractor who had been out camping and barely escaped with his life as well. And as a boy, Ryan found these in a book published by the uh, Everett Herald and was always fascinated by them. And I'd like to, uh, I should say, his title of the work, Vancouver, Vancouver, This Is It, um, are the words, the last words of David A. Johnson, uh, the young volcanologist who was the first to die that day and for whom the observatory up at Mount St. Helens is named. And I'd like to call on Sonia to talk about these. She has a, a distinct perspective. Thanks, Dawson. Yeah, so as mentioned, um, this series of three pieces by Ryan Mullenkamp um, illustrates the first few moments of the eruption. There's a lot going on in these pieces, and I like to say that usually it takes me longer to talk about it than for it to actually have happened. Um, so there's a lot of things happening in quick sequence. Now, these, these pieces of art aren't particularly realistic, of course. You know, there's uh, blue sides to the mountain. Mount St. Helens does not have blue sides. But uh, through the color and texture, there's a lot of science stories that are actually embedded in a really cool way in these pieces of art. So again, these are from like the very first few moments of the eruption. Um, based off of these series of photographs. And, you know, when we have visitors to Mount St. Helens, a lot of times people are curious about, you know, tell me about the time when Mount St. Helens blew its top. I'm like, yeah, yeah. But actually, I want to tell you about what Mount St. Helens dropped its top. Why? Well, the eruption actually began by literally dropping its top. By that, I mean a landslide and not just any landslide. The landslide that began the May 18th, 1980 eruption at Mount St. Helens literally holds the world's record of the largest landslides in the written human record. So, of course, there have been bigger ones throughout 
history, but for as long as humans have been writing it down and observing, the biggest one. So this, uh, this talk is actually a landscape through time. And so I want to take a moment before talking about the 1980 eruption to say what I see about actually the old history of Mount St. Helens. So going further back in time, um, the whole Mount St. Helens system is estimated to be, or is um, the oldest rocks have been dated to be about 300,000 years old. Um, so Mount St. Helens has a long, long history of different kinds of eruptions at different times, building up and breaking down. And so what I notice in these, <clears throat> in these pieces of art is the sections that are making the mountainside, they're different colors, and that really kind of highlights the textures that you see in them. Because what you see in them are these banding, these stripes of more subtle color variations. And that's kind of what you see when you look inside the volcano. Also, it's messy. One of the most incredible experiences I had at Mount St. Helens was when I climbed to the top. And I knew kind of academically what it was going to look like. But when you get to the top, it just blows you away. Wow, look at those red layers, black layers, bright white layers, and not just all even layers. It's very, very messy. So sometimes it's a layer, sometimes it's a big blob from an old lava dome. So anyway, I do think that, that the use of color and texture kind of highlights that or nods to the old history of Mount St. Helens. But also these series, of, these series of paintings really do an awesome job at highlighting some of the really interesting features of those first few moments of the eruption. So if you look at the first of these paintings, uh, you'll see to the right there, which is the right is on the northern side of the volcano, which is the way that it ended up falling down and the way that it ended up blasting out. You'll see these kind of solid color patches, but um, among those solid color patches are little blobs of white, little blobs of gray, little blobs of black. And so those blobs are at the beginning of the explosion, created when the mountaintop began to drop its top and, and the side. So initially there was a whole bunch of weight on the top of Mount St. Helens, right, from all the weight of the mountaintop. And inside of it was this thing called a cryptodome, Basically, magma was inside the volcano with highly pressurized gas. So once the mountain began to drop its top and the weight of that mountain top was released, it began to explode, kind of like opening up a can or a bottle of shaken up soda or pop, depending on where you're from. So it's showing the very first beginnings of the explosion on May 18th in 1880. And it's doing so in a way that also reminds me of accounts. Um, there was another photographer that took a series of photographs from these beginning moments of the eruption uh, named Gary Rosenquist. And G Gary Rosenquist described the, those first few moments as the mountain was starting to look blurry. And I can see that in that first painting, how the blobs of white and gray and black are blurring the sharper lines of those brightly colored sections. Another thing that really caught my attention when I was looking at these paintings was, was the sky. Um, if you look to the sky, it starts off with this calm, solid blue, and then each subsequent painting has you know, more of this ray-like beam blasting out. And to, to me, that's showing this increasing, accelerating release of energy from the volcano. It also kind of reminds me of the Adam West Batman from back in the day when, you know, whenever Batman would throw a punch, the screen would light up with pow and, you know, these ray beams coming out. So it reminds me of that too. That's just my perspective and nerdery of different kinds coming out. So again, like we see the, like those blobs of like gray and white and black coming out in the first one. And then we can see it coming out more in the second and even more in the third. And so it goes from being blobs to seeing spots where there's streaks, like there's these areas there that look like, um, kind of like contrails from airplanes. And those are where the bombs are, are soaring out in their parabola shape. There's parts where the, the blast is continuing to, to develop both on the top, but also from, 
from the side. You can especially see that in the third painting. And then you're seeing places where the whites, the grays, and the blacks are just kind of swirling around in this turbulent mess. And so this turbulent mess is called pyroclastic material. It's hot gas, hot ash, rocks of different sizes ranging from the powdered size of powdered sugar to again those bombs that were estimated to be the size of small trailers moving at 300 miles per hour. So this was a lot of energy that was released and this was just the beginning of the eruption. I mean the series of events showed here I think that that was about 30 seconds. The third one was about 30 seconds or so after the first one. So it took me way longer to talk about just what we're seeing here than for it to actually have happened. Um, and I want to bring it back again just for a moment to, uh, to what Dawson said about um, the name of the, the piece, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Um, again, those are the final words by geologist David Johnston as <clears throat> he was stationed on a nearby ridge collecting data um, and witnessed the beginning of the eruption and radioed that fateful announcement to his colleagues in Vancouver, Washington. Um, he was one of 57 people who lost their lives in the 1980 eruption. And while many, while many lives were saved by the team of scientists and emergency management and response professionals working together during this crisis, um, those 57 lives were lost. And really that's due in part to the uniqueness of the eruption. Mostly when we think about volcanoes, we think about them blasting upwards, not to the sides. And it wasn't unknown that volcanoes could fall down and blast to the, sky, the sides, but the scale up to which that could happen hadn't been observed and wasn't known. Um, the eruption of Mount St. Helens uh, really had a profound legacy, of course, by those affected by it personally, um, the 57 people and people in their community, family and friends. Um, but it also had a profound effect on the volcanology community. Um, today, the David A. Johnston Cascades Volcano Observatory keeps watch and studies over the volcanoes in Oregon and Washington, Idaho. And things like this, like how volcanoes can erupt sometimes in these weird ways where they fall down and then blast to the side um, that were learned at Mount St. Helens has affected in a real way decision making in volcanic areas during times of unrest in other places and saved lives. So through that tragedy, a lot of um, important lessons were learned that do help others. Thank you, Sonia. As I was preparing the exhibition, I came upon a small black and white photograph of this work by Barbara Noah. Um, in a publication that was based on an exhibition that was held in Pullman, Washington at Washington State University in 1983. And I instantly knew that I had to try to find it. And uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Barbara to talk about her relationship with the mountain and how this work came to be. Okay. Um, I started visiting Mount St. Helens in April of 1980. And it was a novelty or curiosity at that point for there to be a volcano erupting in Washington state. I too am a volcano nut and I still have some of the souvenirs I saved from 1980 right over here. Mount St. Helens ash soap, an iron on patch and a belt buckle. <laughs> I collected these and others because I was fascinated by the mountain but also by the crazy atmosphere of all the people in the media in Cougar, Washington. So I visited many times, driving up logging roads to take photos. And I met a lot of people who lived there as well as news photographers and reporters who were covering it. And it was a circus with tourists in lawn chairs and lively crowds at the local bar. But it was also a sublime spectacle, just amazing. At that time, I thought the mountain was personified as mighty but m many people didn't think of her as dangerous yet, even though scientists had warned that she could be. Unfortunately, on May 18th, I was in Seattle because the weather report had not been good. 
So I wasn't at my usual logging road spot to the south of the mountain where I think I would have been safe. So I drove down as soon as I heard about it, but I had to detour off I-5 uh, all the way to the coast because the Toodle River was flooding and that threatened the I-5 bridge over the highway. So when I finally got down there, access was blocked and I had to watch from far away also knowing that people I had met could have been in harm's way. The next day, I went to the Colombian newspaper office in Vancouver, and the mood there was really somber be because one of their photographers who I had met had been killed by the eruption. Mount St. Helens at that point had transformed from an entertaining novelty into a tragic natural disaster. And that became a theme for me when I made art about it through the lens of pareidolia, which is the imagined perception of a pattern or meaning where it doesn't exist, like seeing faces and things. I used a USGS black and white photo for this piece because I couldn't get close to the mountain on May 18th and because I saw a face in the ash cloud. So I printed it on photo linen, added the eyes, the running figure, and the primal thick red paint emphasizing the force of the eruption. To me, it represents the transformation of Mount St. Helens from entertaining to terrifying, from Muppet to monster, and from the ridiculous to the sublime. Thanks, Dawson and Mount St. Helens Institute, and I'm honored to be in the show and to be here today. Thank you, Barbara, thanks very much. It wasn't just on May the 18th that the volcano erupted. It, uh, the first major eruption was on March the 27th. And this painting by Hank Pander portrays the eruption on July the 22nd, um, when the eruption plume was seen against this clear summer sky. Um, Hank has been Portland's history painter for over 50 years now, uh, since he arrived from the Netherlands. and. Uh, He's particularly fascinated uh, with the great volcanoes of the Pacific Northwest because, as he uh, describes it, they're about as undutch as it gets. And um, I love this painting. It normally resides in a conference room in City Hall where very few people get to see it. And one of the many things I love about it is that Hank positions on that glass tabletop in the foreground devices of observation echoing the purpose of the painting. And he includes that miniature television. And we should pause um, to tell younger people that in 1980, those little TVs were all the rage. And that they were kind of at the very beginning of miniaturization uh, of consumer products that have ultimately result resulted in cell phones. And for me, the way he uses it, the way he connects the eruption plume to the little television set uh, by, by, with the antenna, um, expresses how we humans need to take things that are utterly overwhelming to us in, in scale and power and reduce them down to a scale that doesn't quite frighten us as much. Sonia, tell us about that eruption plume. Sure, thanks Dawson. So time to get nerdy again about volcano science. What's really striking to me about Hank Pander's piece is through my <coughs> volcano loving eyes is how well he captured the shape and the structure of the ash plume. Uh, so Yep, volcanic explosions, and I want to go off on a little bit of a story here to talk about ash plume structures. So volcanic explosions can be small and large and every size in between, right? There are different names to classify these eruptions based on how explosive they are. Large eruptions with tall ash columns are called Plinian. And I bring this up because Dawson was showing a piece earlier representing Mount Vesuvius. And probably many of you know, there was a very famous eruption at Mount Vesuvius back in 79 AD. It's what 
destroyed the communities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, and there were eyewitnesses to this. And so there are written records of people's observations. Specifically, um, this person named Pliny the Younger, um, which is why the big eruptions are now called Plinian eruptions. Um, he wrote a description of the ash column and I'm gonna read it to you for a moment. About one in the afternoon, my mother pointed out an ash cloud with an odd size, or pointed out a cloud, pardon me, pointed out a cloud with an odd size and appearance that had just formed. From the distance, it was not clear from which mountain the cloud was rising, although it was found afterwards to be Eusebius. The cloud could best be described as more like an umbrella pine than any other tree because it rose up high in a kind of trunk and then divided into branches. Sometimes it looked light colored, sometimes it looked mottled and dirty with the earth and ash it had carried up. So when I first read this during the time that I was first starting to get really nerdy about volcanoes and studying them in school, I was kind of confused because to me that's not what pine trees look like. But then I realized that this is what pine trees look like in Italy, specifically the uh, umbrella pines, Pinus pineas. And you can see how the structure of this particular kind of pine tree is really, really similar to the plume, where you have this, this narrow base that's coming up and then branching out and branching out. Now, when Pliny was making these observations, he was also uh, trying to figure out uh, an explanation. So he, in just a moment, I want to read this. And this is <clears throat> so Pliny went on to write, um, I imagine that this is because it was thrust up by the initial blast until its power weakened and was left unsupported and spread out sideways under its own weight. Well, that's that's a pretty good explanation, but it's not the whole story. I mean, considering the fact that this was back in 79 AD. It's a really good description, um, but I'm just going to walk through some of the, the parts of what goes on in an ash column um, that ends up giving it this unique, distinctive structure. So step one, there's a rock, this rock material that blasts out from the volcano. And at that point, its motion is really just controlled by its initial momentum. I mean, think about just throwing a ball in the air, right? You give it momentum, it goes. This is called the jet phase. That's just the name for it. But rocks are heavy, right? And when I throw a ball into the air, gravity does its gravity thing and the rock, or the ball comes back down. So what's interesting is, you know, how does this stuff keep going upwards? Um, the, 19, the May 18th, 1988 eruption had a plume that went 15 miles into the sky. Um, others in the six year eruptive period afterwards weren't as high, but still going up very, very high. What's going on is that inside of this ash plume, everything is really hot. There's hot gas, there's hot rocks. And we know from science that when you heat up a gas, it expands. So this mixture, as it's rising, it starts to expand. So it starts um, fanning out a little bit, a little bit as it's progressively expanding. And so if it expands enough, it becomes less dense than the air, which is pretty crazy to think about this mixture of rocks in the air being less dense than air, but that's how it works. And so it rises up like a hot air balloon at that point. Um, so even if it's run out of that initial momentum, that initial energy at the start of the blast, it can keep rising like that hot air balloon. So it keeps going and going and eventually it reaches a height in the atmosphere where the density of this mixture is the same as the air around it. And at this point, I kind of think about it like a scuba diver. So scuba divers use their tools and their know-how about good techniques for scuba diving to make it so that they can just easily, gracefully glide. And scuba divers will refer this to as neutral buoyancy, which is exactly what we say about volcanic plumes once they get into this region called the umbrella region, this place of neutral buoyancy. So basically, it doesn't want to go up, it doesn't want to go down, and it can just easily move to the side. So like a scuba diver, it can just gently pick 
their fin and move to the side. Once this mixture gets to this point in the atmosphere where it's all neutral, it's not up or down to the side, then little, even small winds can push the ash, push this rock mixture to locations far away, um, sometimes across the state or across the US, like in the May 18th, 1980 eruption, depending on how um, big the eruption is and how high it goes. So uh, Hank Pander did a really good job of representing this structure um, in his painting. And in particular, really, I mean, not just the general shape of these ash columns with a jet phase, convective phase, an umbrella region, but particular to that day, because on July 22nd, 1980, there were actually multiple eruptions, one after the other. So there was um, one blast in the early evening that went about 10 miles into the sky. And a little over an hour later, there was another one. So what happened, what happened in this painting or what happened in real life that's represented in this painting is that um, it went up and then it reached this neutral point and formed an umbrella region. And that's the lower of the flat regions. But if you look above the, if you look to the top of the ash plume, it's almost like there's, there's two layers of umbrella regions where it's fanning out and starting to be spread out by the wind. And that's because in that hour after that first blast, there was another blast that went actually higher. So it blasted through that first region and went above and then spread out for the second part. Um, so yes, I just get really excited about this Hank Pander piece for all of the scientific nerdery you can take out of it, both for just volcanology in general and plume dynamics, but also he made some really great observations on that day. And it's clear that he took a really, really close look and did a great job representing it. Thanks, Sonia. I hope, hope Hank's out there listening. Hank continued his fascination with Mount St. Helens uh, 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 lasted over quite a few years. And the other Portland artist um, who was fascinated with the eruption and indeed made the erupting volcano a leitmotif in his work was George Johansson. Um, in 1980, George really wanted to retire from decades of teaching in the Museum Art School. And he was having a hard time making that decision and was looking for a sign. And so when the volcano blew, that was the sign and he retired and quickly portrayed himself reborn here. Uh, those of you who know George know, will recognize him in this uh, image of himself as a baby, reborn as a full-time artist. And we see the erupting volcano behind here and George, truly uses it as a signifier of place in his many portrayals of Portland. Um, this is just one of uh, the paintings in the show, or not a painting, in, well, yeah, painting, but a painting on ceramic tiles. Um, this is the same technique that George used in making the much larger panoramic view of Portland that many of you know from the Multnomah County Library. And he has just a wonderful time here. Uh, he takes the shape of the eruption plume. Again, this one not to do with science, um, much more about art. He takes that shape, echoes it in the hot air balloons, in the paddle of the kayaker, and in the jets of water emanating from the tugboat. The next section of the exhibition is entitled After the Cataclysm. And you'll find a great many very distinguished photographers represented in, in uh, this part of the show. Um, one of them uh, is Emmett Gowan. And Emmett had a fellowship from the state of Washington and was in Washington in 1980. And his attention was diverted with the eruption of the volcano. And he returned again and again, year after year. Um, to record it and its transformations. This has become one of the most iconic images of the destruction to the north of the volcano. And I wonder, Ray, could you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Sure. Um, 
folks have talked about being in the blast zone soon after the eruption and, and, and feeling uh, kind of discombobulated because of the lack of color. Everything was, was you know, tones of, of white and gray and black, except for the blue sky, um, which really gets at a feeling of lifelessness, right? I think Jimmy Carter flew over the volcano right at, right at the eruption and said that um, the moon looks like a golf course uh, compared to Mount St. Helens or something to that effect, right? So this idea, it's just, it was devoid of life, but this picture, dead center of it, what do you see? There's a pond. So, you know, Mount St. Helens did, you know, it took the life of 57 people and, and really changed the landscape in many ways, but also created new forms of life. Before the eruption, there were something like, I don't know, 30 lakes and ponds within the boundary of the current monument. And after the eruption, there were something like 130 or more, right? So the new, new, uh, new landscape features and new opportunities for life were created even when it looked like there was nothing. And so that's kind of my, my thought about this. And somebody, you know, photos early on are black and white, um, but, you know, life was already starting from the very beginning. Well, black and white photography was the perfect medium uh, for recording this monochromatic landscape. Uh, black and white photography can capture just the most subtle variations in light and textures. And uh, you see an example of why it was such an excellent medium here. This is another of Emmett's photographs. Um, this made four years after the eruption, and it shows ash in the Cowlitz River at the confluence with the Columbia. And it's all but abstract uh, in, this mar in these marvelous, marvelous patterns. The ash was, of course, um, a very big deal for those who lived uh, north and west of the mountain. And it was also used by glass artists. Um, this wonderful work by Paul Marioni, one of the most distinguished uh, uh, of the glass artists of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and he and his friend Rob Adamson drove, they heard about the ash fall in, in Eastern uh, Washington and got in the car, drove out that day, collected a barrel full of the stuff and came back and Paul blew this space from Mount St. Helens ash, pure Mount St. Helens ash, the night of the eruption. The colors that you see are from metallic fuming agents that were uh, uh, one of the last steps in the process. I'm gonna just show you, there it is in the center of this case. And I wanted to point out, the case shows uh, Glass Works, um, the Glass Eye Studio in Seattle, continues to use a little Mount St. Helens ash in all of the glass that it produces. But I wanted to point out the two uh, at opposite ends, the dark green ones. Um, Mount St. Helens ash, when fused uh, into, into glass, um, is this very, very deep green color. And what we have in those two objects at the far ends of this case are two works that were molded glass, made the one on the right by Glass Eye Studio in Seattle, the one on the left uh, by Bullseye Glass here in Portland from Mount St. Helens Ash. And they're called dishes today, but they're really ash trays. Uh, remember, there were a lot more smokers in 1980. The thing that really compelled artists uh, almost more than anything else after the eruption was the blowdown of the old growth forests. Here you see uh, some of the patterns formed. Uh, Marilyn Bridges uh, calls this swirl and, and it records eddies that were a part of, of the, the blast out from the volcano. Charles Arnoldi had been using twigs and branches very brightly colored and, and put together to form marvelous works of art. And they were usually perforated. You could see through them uh, to the wall behind. And he was so moved by what he saw in the blowdown of old growth forests um, that he created a few works thereafter. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, on the left side, uh, the split pieces of wood look charred, and on the right, uh, ash laden.
Diane Cook and Len Gensel uh, made this wonderful photograph in 2009. Um, and they happened on this scene not long after a snowfall dusted the tops of those tree trunks in the water. And lest anyone think that these are twigs, we included this wonderful photograph by Buzzy Sullivan, uh, made in 2017 on uh, the banks of Spirit Lake, um, where he's included this human behind that gives us a sense of, of the scale of these giant, uh, giant logs. One small subsection of uh, the exhibition um, deals with a visit made by Hank Pander um, and his great friend, the renowned uh, Portland author of fantasy and science fiction, uh, Ursula K, K. Le Guin, who was as fascinated uh, by Mount St. Helens as Hank was. Um, she could see it from the window of her study. And I learned in reading her essay called Coming Back to the Lady, she, she referred to Mount St. Helens as the lady, um, that she found words inadequate uh, in describing the mountain. And so she made works of art. And I'm going to show you one of them uh, in just a moment. But I need to explain before we leave, uh, leave this that she and Hank got an early pass into the red zone around the mountain. And they visited it in October of 1981, along with the photographer Ron Cronin. And Hank came back and made this portrait of his friend and included a depiction of the sixth moon of Saturn, Enceladus, behind. And just at the time that all of this was going on, Voyager was transmitting back the first close-up images of this moon. And uh, you see uh, it evidenced in this work, which Hank felt very appropriate to Ursula Le Guin. And here's one of her pastels. We're very grateful to her son, Theo Downs Le Guin. Uh, once I knew that she had been doing this, I, I asked Theo if um, if we might show a few. And there are six of them in the show. You should check them out in the virtual exhibition. And uh, then once we reopen, uh, please come to see them. They're subtle, beautiful. She never had any formal training uh, as an artist. And they're really quite wonderful. The last section of the exhibition deals with Mount St. Helens as an active, ever-evolving landscape. This photograph was made by uh, another preeminent landscape photographer, uh, Frank Golke, who also visited the mountain many, many times over the years. And like Emmett Gowan, uh, uh, Golke made a wonderful photographic essay on the mountain. And this photograph was made inside the crater, uh, which he described as the most otherworldly place that he had ever been. And Sonia, I wonder if you'd talk with us about this and, and what's going on in the upper right corner. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think that otherworldly is the perfect word to use to describe the crater. Um, so the crater of Mount St. Helens, it's this large horseshoe shape. It's not a hole, it's horseshoe, and it opens out to the northern side where the mountain fell down and then blasted out from to the side. And this crater is over a mile wide and it has over a thousand foot walls. And when you have a thousand walls that are steep um, with a bunch of stuff that geologically recently <laughs> fell down, then there's a lot of loose material that can continue to fall down. And at Mount St. Helens, a lot is still going on geologically, even when there's not eruptions. Um, from there can be um, generally, not um, recently or anything, but at volcanoes, there can be mud flows without eruptions. There can be here in this picture, rock falls from the crater wall. So what we're seeing on the upper right, you can see these areas of light that's kind of branching off in some other directions and the light is the tiny, tiny ash um, and the rocks that are gleaming in the sun as the rocks are tumbling down, smashing around, breaking apart and puffing upwards a little bit with those bits of broken 
um, small bits of ash that are lofting upwards. It does look like as well there's uh, another rock fall possibly on the left hand side of the photograph where it's kind of gleaming um, but it's a little bit difficult to be to, to really tell but I mean the fact is that rock falls happen very very frequently in fact a lot of visitors to Mount St. Helens have the question of is that an eruption and people ask this because much of the time um, not quite daily, but it's not usual to see a few per week. When you're looking at the volcano, you'll see little puffs of grayish, brownish ash coming out from the crater. Now, Mount St. Helens hasn't erupted since 2008, so it's not an eruption. And of course, there's scientists who are watching who would um, let us know that there are signs of something coming. But there's tons of rock falls that happen from these walls that are a thousand feet high. And so this not only illustrates that the volcano is still um, demonstrating geologic phenomena in real time that you could see if you visited Mount St. Helens, but these rock falls have other really interesting stories that they've created there in the crater of Mount St. Helens. You know, we know that we live in a world of climate change, right? We know that the vast majority of glaciers around the world are shrinking. And there's only a few places in the world where there is the exception to that rule, where there are glaciers that are actively growing. And Mount St. Helens is one of these places. And it has all to do with the unique conditions there inside of the crater. So the, the crater is this land with rock falls and it's a land of shadow. I mean, that's a big shadow you can cast when it's a 1,000 foot wall. So not only is there shadow that helps keep things a little bit cooler there inside of the crater, but also there are these rock falls. And so when the rock comes down, it lays down on top of the glacier. And when it does that, it really insulates the glacier um, layer by layer as more rock falls come down and coat it and coat it. And so it's kind of like the glacier is putting on a really thick coat that gets thicker every day and insulates it more and more, which has allowed the glacier inside the crater, called Crater Glacier, to, to start off as you know, very small and then become a horseshoe shape. And um, now it's a full on donut shape that's inside the crater, ringing around the lava dome of Mount St. Helens. We're back in the crater uh, with this marvelous work of art by Brad Johnson. Um, it is built up on top of a photograph that he made there. And I went to visit Brad, uh, who lives in Trout Lake near the mountain. He visits it often. Uh, I went to visit him with Stephanie. And we went to see a very different kind of work, collages that he was making, uh, expressing the changes going on in the landscape uh, by cutting up photographs and reassembling them. And that day I noticed this off on another wall uh, of his studio and it drew me to it. And I looked at it and I, I, I thought, I, I, well, what is this? It's, it's like a tornado or no, no, it's, it's an inverted volcano, a volcano turned on its head. Um, uh, or maybe a Tower of Babel turned on its head. And I saw all of these other things, and I'm telling you all of this um, just to have a little fun with myself, because the real source um, was Botticelli's Map of Hell based on the description in Dante's Inferno. And here you see this funnel shape, and depending on how heinous your sin uh, was, it de determined where you were. Um, in this, and all being funneled down here uh, to the devil uh, at the bottom. And so Brad is trying to find forms that express the feelings that he has when he's in the crater and it being uh, an otherworldly experience. The fact that I saw all of these other things from this it is, just shows the power of forms uh, to create a kind of universality. And 
no interpretation is the wrong interpretation. You should check out Brad's website, his series, Mount St. Helens Thin Place Inferno uh, continues. And I should say that do check out the virtual exhibition because many of the artists uh, in the show wrote their own labels as statements. And so you should see what Brad and Barbara Noah and others wrote about their works. This is one of the beautiful new landscapes, a landscape that didn't exist um, before the eruption. It's uh, Lewitt Falls. Um, and this photograph really struck me as soon as I saw it. Um, and I, I remember taking it to our curator of photography, Julia Dolan, and Julia just went, wow, um, this, is, this is like Ansel Adams, which of course is very, very high praise. Um, and I, one of the reasons I love it is that it's black and white, and then you get this one patch. Here we are a mile from uh, the lava dome, and we have life returning. And I wonder, could I get Ray, Sonia, would you, would you both like to chime in here? You've been up there. I should say first that Buzzy, um, I hope he won't mind me saying this, Buzzy was once a champion skateboarder, and I'm told that he moves about uh, the rough landscape like a, a mountain goat, uh, even with heavy photographic uh, equipment in tow. Um, so those of you who've been there, tell us about this. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, you know, this is a really popular hike. It's not, it's still quite a distance from a trailhead, but um, to get here, you have to cross the Pumas Plain, which in the summertime is just erupting with wildflowers and the scent of wildflowers. And, um, you know, it can be hot and dry out there, but you, you hike up to this viewpoint of Lewitt Falls, which is coming out of the crater. Of course, this wasn't here before the eruption. This is a landscape created after the eruption. And actually Brad's um, last piece was taken above Lewitt Falls uh, on that same drainage. Uh, so it's really a, a beautiful place. And, and you see a lot of mountain goats heading up here too, but it's a waterfall coming out of the crater of a volcano, which is kind of mind blowing. Sonia? Yeah, and so you know, looking at this picture for me, it begs the question, where's all that water coming from? And of course, rainwater is a part of it, but the melt from the glacier uh, up about St. Helens is a big part of it. Um, that, that feeds the system that ends up coming down in Lewitt Falls. And uh, it's not just cold glacial water up there, um, but actually just a, a bit uh, beyond the waterfall and then a bit to the right, beyond the lump over there, are some places where there's hot water coming out too. Um, so when I had the opportunity to go into the crater of Mount St. Helens, I took these photos and what you're seeing here is the confluence of the glacial meltwater, which is this kind of chocolate, milky chocolate brown color, um, with hot water coming from some of the, the hot spring drainage, the hot drainage up in the crater. Uh, and so that's that very vibrant green that you see. I'm not exactly sure why it's vibrant green. My best guess is that there's some sort of like um, heat, lo heat loving thermophilic bacteria kind of like it makes the very vibrant colors in Yellowstone hot springs. Um, I would love to learn more about that, but I don't have the answer there. But anyway, it's this vibrant green from the hot water meeting the, the cold water from the glacier. And again, Mount St. Helens hasn't erupted since 2008, but it insulates itself really well from the rock falls and just from all of the rest of the rock that has cooled on the outside of the lava dome and other surfaces. And so since it insulates itself so well, there's still quite a bit of heat inside the volcano that, again, it hasn't erupted in 12 years, um, but it's still warm inside. So it heats up that groundwater that, that oozes out there. Um, and then sometimes you still might see Mount St. Helens steaming a bit um, from rainwater or whatnot that soaks in and then um, heats up and sometimes comes out as a little bit of steam. Thank you. Uh, another 
wonderful photograph by uh, Diane Cook and Lynn Jensel uh, showing uh, the return of life uh, in the form of this Roosevelt elk herd. Uh, I love this, the, the color of the elk um, uh, against the gray of the landscape emerging um, into the sunlit part. Uh, it's just an, an exquisite photograph. And um, we're running a bit over here, so I'm gonna move ahead to the final work of art in the show by Cameron Martin. Cameron was born and raised in Seattle, uh, knew the mountain well. He's been living in New York for uh, many years now. And this is the largest painting he's made to date. It's 11 feet wide. Um, and it truly is a work that you need to experience uh, firsthand. And he expresses the instability of Mount St. Helens optically because the black from a distance reads as solid. And when you stand before this painting, there's a real sense of presence. But as you approach the canvas, the black shifts to read as void. And in this way, he expresses what an unstable landscape this is. And as you've noticed, he likens it in the title, Remission, he likens it to a human body with an incurable disease that will inevitably return. And so as we close out here, I'd really like to bring back Ray and Nathan to talk about the future at Mount St. Helens. Sure. Um, well, this was fantastic. I really enjoyed hearing everybody speaking about these different pieces. I'll never get tired of it. The future of Mount St. Helens. You know, one thing I think about uh, that, I, that I think about frequently with Mount St. Helens and the, all these pieces remind me that is a sense of scale and how Mount St. Helens uh, challenges that for people and allows us to connect with these with these scales that oftentimes we can't fathom, whether it be physical space and the size, the sheer size of the volcano or time, right? To think that Mount St. Helens itself, really think everything above 4,000 feet is only 2,000 years old. Mountains are things that are just permanent in our brains, they never change. But in fact, Mount St. Helens is constantly changing. And you know, it's been 40 years from the eruption, which seems like, wow, that's a long time. That's my whole life pretty much. I was just a, a wee child when the mountain erupted. Um, but it's a blink of an eye and that landscape continues to change and continues to evolve with new stories coming out of it all the time. I, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the return of mountain goats uh, and I won't st steal Nathan's thunder there if he's going to talk about goats, uh, other wildlife, um, if it's challenges around Spirit Lake that, that we're, we're, we're dealing with now, whatever it is, the place is, is still so relevant and new stories are being told constantly. And so um, it's not a time to just look at something that happened in the past, but to think about the future and all it holds for us. And if folks have not visited there, it's, it's a good thing to do frequently because you can see that change yeah, right yeah. before your eyes. Uh, I'd also like to offer my thanks to Dawson and other folks uh, today for putting this exhibit on and this virtual presentation on. I'd like to carry on what Ray talked about a little bit. And there's a narrative that is often portrayed by folks who experienced the eruption, and that's one of trauma uh, as a result of the 1980 eruption, and one of loss, uh, and death is involved. Um, and I do acknowledge that, but for the Cowlitz tribe and for the indigenous people of this landscape, the frame is different than just the 1980 eruption. So many people who are new to this landscape arrived here and they had that mountains are permanent identity, belief, structure that Ray just talked about. But for the Indian families and communities that have been living here on this landscape for thousands of years, I mentioned earlier that there are stories of the mountain and her roles in narratives, her character that she plays in the landscape. And a very important one is related to the Bridge of the Gods myth in the Columbia River Gorge, where Lawalakla is the keeper of the fire. And, it, and in exchange for sharing fire, she is transformed from an old woman 
to a young maiden. And again, the geology we know from uh, geologic inquiry and science that the previous big eruption happened about 500 years before the 1980 eruption, in about 1480. And in that eruption, Lakla lost a thousand feet of the top of the mountain. And so in the intervening 500 years, she transformed herself from a shattered, wizened old woman back to a young maiden, these graceful slopes that we see and we knew prior to 1980, through this constant series of dome building eruptions. And that's who she is, again, that's the role she plays in this landscape. And so when you go into this deeper time frame of an indigenous knowledge of this landscape, we find that she erupts time and time again. She erupted 500 years ago. She erupted much more vigorously 3,000 years ago. And so the eruption of 1980 and all the ways it's captured and illustrated in this artwork express our own individual relationships with the mountain and what we feel. But whether it is the beautiful slopes being ravaged by the eruption, or whether it is wildlife returning, or whether it is each lupin plant that colonizes the pumice plain, that landscape is a constantly changing landscape. And so for me, the lesson here isn't the 1980 eruption, but the lesson is that that landscape around Mount St. Helens is a constant landscape of transformation. And the more that we know and we realize that all of us together living on this landscape, the more we will better be able to align ourselves with how we live on this landscape and how we go forward living in partnership with the mountain so that she can continue to do the thing that she does and she's called to do and erupt again because she will and we need to be prepared for that all of us. Thank you, Nathan. And, and thank you so much to all of our special guests today. Uh, I'm very grateful for your appearances and uh, your insights. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephanie now. Hi, everyone. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you to Nathan and Ray and Sonia and Dawson and Barbara for being here. I know we are running uh, a little bit over. We were hoping to be done um, at about 4.45, but I'm just gonna ask a couple questions that have come in and other questions that we don't get to. We are gonna um, put our heads together with the Mount St. Helens Institute and try to answer those online. Um, so if you don't hear your question um, asked and answered, uh, look at the Facebook comments and we'll try to get those, um, get answers for you. But the first one, um, I'd love to hear Nathan Dawson comes in from Marsha Williams and asks, wasn't, wasn't Lewitt another name of the mountain from another tribe besides the Cowlitz? Nathan, you want to feel that? Sure. Um, hi, Marsha. <laughs> um, so, Lotla is the name for Mount St. Helens in Cowlitz languages. Um, Lewitt is a shortened version of that name. And uh, so it's sort of a nickname uh, for the full name of Lawit Latla. Uh, Lewitt is also more commonly used by the Yakima tribes uh, on the east side of the Cascades and those living in the Columbia Gorge proper. But both names are appropriate to use. The Kalitz tribe uses Lawatla, the complete name from the Kalitz language when folks talk about her. I'm not sure, have we said today um, that the mountain is the most prominent lands, uh, landscape form on the Kalitz tribe's ancestral lands and, and that's significant to understand here? Yes, it is. And as a matter of fact, the um, the mountain was listed on the National Register of Historic Places as a cultural property, a traditional cultural property for the Kalitz tribe and the Confederated Tribes of the Yakima uh, Reservation. 
uh, Yakima Nation. And that is an interesting status and the unique, fairly unique there of over 80,000 properties listed on the National Register of Historic Places. There are only 23 traditional properties. So um, it's an uncommon ranking to have. Uh, and it speaks to the longstanding cultural and spiritual relationship between indigenous peoples and the mountain. I'm going to just briefly mention here, uh, for those of you interested in reading more about this, you should consult uh, Nathan's article along with Richard McClure um, about the process for gaining this designation as a traditional cultural property that is packed with information. And um, you would enjoy it. It's from the Journal of Northwest Anthropology, fall 2015. Stephanie? Excellent. Uh, here's a question about the landslide. Um, is it the largest recorded landslide after Mauna Loa, uh, which happened, I guess, last year? Is it the, the largest? Good question. I can't be confident in my answer. Um, so I'm just going to have to defer this one. But I do believe that it still holds the ranking for the the largest observed landslide in human history. But I could always be wrong, so let's fact check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can get an answer to that in, the, in our comments. Uh, Barbara, somebody is interested to know if you have still continued to visit Mount St. Helens since your 1980s uh, experiences. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Uh, about three months after it erupted, I uh, I hired a plane to fly me over it. <laughs> you know, saw all the toothpick trees laying down. And, you know, I've been back a, um, other times since then, including with my daughter's uh, class when she's now 25, but uh, my daughter's class when um, they went on a field trip down there, I came along. <laughs> so, um, yes. And I, I actually was just thinking as I was watching this presentation today that I, I would like to go down there and do a hike. Can't do it right now, but. No. Nope. <laughs> for a variety okay. of reasons, but um, yeah, I have gone back periodically. Great. Well, Dawson, I think we should probably wrap it up here. Do you want to tell folks about the virtual exhibition and uh, how they might access that? Yes, if you'll just go to our website, the Portland Art Museum website. And change and, the slide. Yes, here we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And you can go right to the address you see here or go to our website and you'll find it under the exhibition tab, current exhibitions, and you'll find it there. Um, we have about 90% of the works of art in the show included, and we're going to fill in that extra 10% um, uh, when we're able. We've just not been able to access good images in the midst of this pandemic. Okay, and then maybe the next slide. And then tomorrow, as you all know, is the 40th anniversary of the eruption. And um, there are some amazing programs that we just like to, you know, mention and point you to, um, including the Gifford Pinchot National Forest at two o'clock. We'll do an Ask a Ranger uh, program live on Facebook. Washington State Parks has done an amazing job of capturing oral histories um, from folks who experienced the 1980 eruption. And at six o'clock, also on Facebook, at, on their website, um, you will be able to hear some oral histories and also uh, ranger uh, programs. And then there's two things vying for your attention at 6.30. Um, OMSI is doing a virtual uh, science pub um, with uh, Heather White. Heather Wright, rather, um, a volcanologist from USGS, and the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network will be doing a program on the Cascade Range volcanoes, um, so sort of a wider view of the volcanoes in our midst at 6.30. I know all of those things are gonna be recorded as well, so if you can't make one of them, you will be able to visit uh, those, uh, the Facebook pages or websites to, to, to revisit them. Um, and all of this information is on our website. If you go to portlandartmuseum.org on our blog, we have all the partner programs for tomorrow um, uh, listed. So please take advantage of that. 
So I think that is what we have Stephanie, today. Yeah. I, I just want to make one more uh, comment. And, and that is that all the great ideas in the world would be nothing without the funding uh, uh, that makes them really possible in the end. And so I'd like to salute the sponsors of the uh, exhibition, the Ford Family Foundation, Dorothy Pascentini, and Flowery, um, Carol Ann and Kent Caveney, Theo and Nancy Downs Le Guin, and the European and American Art Council of the Portland Art Museum. We're very, very grateful to them and for others who pat patronize the show. And we're especially grateful to all of the lenders, especially because um, so many of them have parted with works of art from their walls uh, uh, over what is turning out to be a very long period. So thanks to you all very, very much. And special thanks to all the folks today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Stay safe out there. Visit the museum to hear more about our reopening. We don't have a date yet, but we are hoping to welcome you all back very, very soon to come see Volcano. Have a great night.